Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Deeply Rooted Podcast. My name is Erin. And I'm Liz. And we're really excited that you're joining us. Last week on the podcast, we dove into week one of the new Planting Roots Bible study, which is on the book of Philippians that focuses on how our heavenly citizenship should transform our military assignments. The title of week one was 30,000 foot flyover. And we discussed how oftentimes we can miss much of the beauty and depth of the Bible if we don't zoom out first and view the story in its entirety. This is true with life as well. We see different things when we zoom out versus when we zoom in and even different things when we put another lens on altogether. This week, we're going to take a look at section two of the Bible study titled Establishing Residency. But before we do, I wanted to mention that if you're new to the Bible or like me, you are working your way through understanding the Bible as a whole complete story. I would encourage you to check out one of Planning Roots' is previous publications. This is the Bible Bootcamp for Military Women. And this is a 45-day devotional that does a really good job walking you through the Old and New Testament, covering the main themes and important details in a way that's really easy for us as military women and wives to understand. When I was first uh, getting together with a mentor of mine, she and I went through this together, and it was really helpful uh, just in understanding the Bible from that 30,000 foot overview that we kind of talked about last week. So I will link this resource down below in the comment section. And so we'll link this resource down below in the description of this podcast. So if again, you're new seasoned anywhere in between, check this out. It's a really good resource. So on this week's podcast, we're going to be talking about establishing our residency spiritually. So as Christians, we know that when we die, we'll be with God in heaven. So how do we establish our residency there? How much does it affect the way we live today? Which influences us more in our day-to-day decisions, our current duty station or a place of retirement? I think we can all agree that our current duty station impacts us more. The Bible teaches an upside down sort of life, one that often flips our understanding of reality and challenges our preconceived notions. So God emphasizes our heavenly destiny repeated in scripture. According to him, it should affect us more than our current location does. So kind of backwards from the way we're living now, where we're focused on our current duty station, not where we're going to retire. But the Bible teaches that we should focus on our heavenly residency and where we're going rather than where we are more. So we're going to be talking that about that a lot in today's podcast. And I think it's going to be a really good one and I'm really excited to get into it. Yeah. So the questions, where are you from? What is your state of residency? These are questions that are really familiar to us as military women. Legal residency is not proven by one single thing. It's proven by the intent demonstrated by many small actions. For example, I'm a resident of Washington state and I don't live there. I live in Virginia, but my legal residence in Washington is proven by the fact that I vote there. The fact that my driver's license is from Washington. My license plate is a Washington license plate. So usually, like I said, residence is a state that you actually live in. But for a lot of us, I bet that's not the case. Uh, Liz, where do you have your residency? Mine's Indiana. So that's the same thing. That's where I grew up. So my license plate is from there. My license is from there. Um, and I actually just stopped taxing active duty military. So oh, it's nice. a win-win. Yeah. That's what I was going to say too. A lot of us pick our residency based on the benefits, either either that or it's just where we grew up. I feel like you either don't change it or you change it because of the benefits. Just in general, Liz, how often would you say before doing the study, how often do you think about your heavenly destiny? Not as often as I should. I actually did a heavenly study with my friend. I think it was from the Bible Project like a few months ago. And I feel like that really got me thinking about heaven and what heaven is going to be like. It talked a lot about just like what the Bible says heaven will be like. And it really got me thinking about it a lot more and just the importance of that's where I'm heading. The world is not where I'm going to be in forever. Um, And so that really got me thinking, but I I definitely don't think about it as much as I should, which is seen through my anxiety and through me trying to perform here on earth and just putting all my worth in everything here on earth and like storing up earthly treasures. I think, feel like that's something we can all struggle with. It's like, Oh, I want to buy this. I want to buy that. But it's like, we should be focused more on laying up treasures in heaven than laying treasures up here on earth. And to do that, we need to bring other people to God and bring him to the gospel. But yeah, to answer your question, not as much as I should. I don't think anyone thinks it about it as much as they should, besides maybe Paul. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's one good example, that's for sure. I'd say for me, the only time that I've really thought about it in depth, like I should be doing every day, was when back when I was like com- questioning 
like why we're not comfortable like why sometimes i'm uncomfortable as a christian like simple question uncomfortable in general like i'm speaking like why do i get anxious like you're talking about on tests or why do i physically feel tired sometimes like i was like really questioning i think this was like back like early in my walk with the lord I was like, well, okay, if God is in control of everything, why doesn't he just like make life easy? And you know, that typical question, why do bad things happen to good people? Like mm-hmm. I, I, in order to understand and find an answer to those questions, I really had to understand that like, well, this is not our home. If this was our home and we were completely comfortable here, then why would we want to go to heaven anyway? Like what would the appeal be of heaven if everything was perfect here? So that's kind of the context mm-hmm. that I've thought about it before. But it's not nearly as often as it should be. Like, that should be something that I think about. That should be paired with the gospel. Like, how much I think about the gospel. Like, we should think about the gospel and then also this hope that is awaiting us. And that's what's going to pour into other people. If that's on our hearts, then that's going to be what we talk with other people about, which is the whole point of the gospel. But I do have a question that I've been thinking about throughout the study that I wanted to ask you was, how do you maintain a balance between being eternally minded and effectively fulfilling your duties and obligations on your earthly station? Because I don't think we're to just completely disregard all of our obligations here on earth, but like, how do you maintain a balance between that? Hmm. I think that goes back to something I was referencing in the first episode of the series, just with priorities, because both are important. Um, but we have to realize that one is sort of a means to the other, which is an end. Like our priority of heaven is the end. Like that is what we're working towards. And our priorities here on earth, they're important, but they should ultimately be a stepping stone to get to the end of, of heaven. Like that, that is the end. Uh, so I think like it's, it's when we start viewing our earthly responsibilities as, as soul things like they're that that own as an end um that we get in trouble like when we view our work success as like the pinnacle of of success i think that's where we get caught up sometimes i agree and i think it's important to be diligent here on earth there's a verse i don't remember which one but it says like to work heartily unto the lord and i think by doing that we're able to lead others to Christ. I think having a good work ethic can cause people to ask questions and wonder why you're so focused and working so hard. And if you can point that back to Christ, it can be a good opportunity to um, share the gospel with others as well. Mm -hmm. And I think also just simply centering your whole entire life around God versus having anything else in the center. This morning at church, we were walking through the Lord's prayer and just focusing on how many times it says your, like your kingdom come, your will be done. Like it's not our kingdom, like my kingdom come, my will be done. Like we really have to focus on the Lord and going to him uh, when we're figuring out what our priorities are. And like you said, we're, we should be thinking about him and everything we do. So In week two of the study, it talks about the city of man and the city of God. And it talks about how what matters most about our story is which city we've made our home. So the city of man is a city that opposes God, resisting his presence, his ways, and his love. So we live in a city of man. Uh, The earth today, it opposes God and resists his presence and his ways and his love. And we are in the midst of the city of man, but we're called to be a city of God. So There's a quote in the study by Nancy Guthrie that describes the spiritual city of God as a city built around calling upon God rather than keeping God out. A city built on humility instead of pride, dependence instead of interdependence. Those who reside in the city recognize that the security and significance they need can only come from God. So it talks about how the people of God in the midst of the city of man are called not to be separate, but to be distinctly different from its other inhabitants. So yes, we're in the city of man, but since we're part of the city of God, we're called to be distinctly different and have humility and dependence on God and to recognize that it's his kingdom and not ours, as we said before. Um, So I really liked those illustrations in the study, and it really allowed me to think, oh, where am I laying up my home? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, another way that uh, Guthrie describes the city of man is by saying that it's God-hating, self-loving, self-confident. Uh, and those two things, specifically self-loving and self-confident, again, this is describing the city of man. 
self-loving, self-confident. In today's world, you can clearly tell that we are living in the city of man because most people wouldn't think of self-loving and self-confident as bad things. Like we would view those things as things that we're striving for. Like we want to have self-love and self-confidence, but really in the city of God, like, no, like I'm not confident in myself because I am confident in the Lord. Uh, I love the Lord, not, you know, not necessarily myself. Like, isn't it interesting that the world will take something that God says and twist it just a little bit so that it sounds appealing, but it's not at all truth. It's their truth, but not God's truth because God says we're supposed to have confident trust in him. And we are able to be confident if we have that in him, but we'll never truly be able to be confident just in ourselves because I'm a sinner and I'm imperfect and I fail. And as well with the self-love thing, we, we should recognize the love God has for us and be fulfilled in that. It's not necessarily about loving yourself, but it's like accepting the way God sees mm-hmm. you. And I just think it's interesting that the world will take something that is kind of from the Bible and just twist it a little bit so that it's appealing. Yeah. Well, and it really just sets us up for failure. Like the whole idea of self-love and self-confidence, like if you're really striving for that, then you're never going to fully achieve it. Like there's no way to fully be completely self-confident. Like, yeah, you're just setting yourself up for failure. It's like the world is bringing you up and then it's dropping you flat on your face. There are two questions I also wrote down that I asked myself throughout this study and I think can show you kind of where your heart is and where you've made up camp. And it was convicting for me, but one question is how much does our knowledge of heaven impact the way we live today? So if it's not influencing our lives at all, we may have set up camp in the city of man. Mm -hmm. So if we're not thinking about heaven and letting that impact the way we live, then we might be in the wrong city. And then Mm -hmm. another question, if Jesus were to come back tomorrow, how would we live differently? So if there are significant changes we would have to make, it's an indication that we've aligned ourselves with the city of man. If God was to come back tomorrow, we should be ready um, to meet our father and not, if you, if he's coming back tomorrow and you have to clean up a bit and get everything ready for his arrival, like you're probably setting up camp in the city of man. And I'm guilty of that. So just examining your heart and um, where you stand, I think is super important as we go through this study. Hmm. That kind of reminds me of something I said yesterday about just something I've been learning with parenting. Like when I am thinking about Weston, like graduating, my son is two months old right now. When I think about him, like graduating high school and like heading out into this world, like then I, I like view it. I know I'm going to look back and like either think I did a good job, not that it's completely my responsibility, but I'm going to either look back and be proud of the the work that I did and the t- like the way that I use my time, or I'm going to look back and be like, man, like I could have spent more time like uh, with him versus on Instagram or with him versus, you know, doing stuff that is not worthy of my time. So later on in life, I don't want to look back and think about all the ways that I wasted my time and wasn't chasing towards the Lord. Like I want to know that I was full hearted, full force heading towards him. So we've talked a lot about the city of God and the city of man. So I think it's important to talk about how do we become heavenly citizens? Um, If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then um, listen to what we're going to talk about and you can accept Jesus into your life and become a resident of the city of God. So one thing that I think is an easy way to lay out the gospel, and I'm sure um, if you've been in the church, then you've heard of the Romans road. So um, I just wanted to go through that really quick, um, just to talk about the gospel and what that means. So starting in Romans 3.23, um, it states that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So this verse highlights the universal condition of humanity and emphasizes that everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's perfect standard. So it's important to understand this um, as you become a heavenly resident, it's important to understand that I'm not worthy to be entered in the kingdom of heaven, but because of what Jesus did for me on the cross, um, I'm able to. So I think that verse just lays out our sinfulness and we have to recognize that we are sinners. And then Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So this verse explains the consequences of our sin, which is death, but also presents a solution offered by God through Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. So Jesus Christ offers us that a solution to our sinfulness. So all hope is not lost. And then Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
So this first illustrates God's love for humanity by sending Jesus to die for our sins, even though we were undeserving. And then Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So these verses explain the response required for salvation, which is believing in Jesus as Lord and confessing that belief with one's mouth. If you're wanting to become a resident of heaven, then declaring with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved. That's what this verse is saying. And then Romans 10, 13 says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So this verse emphasizes the inclusivity of salvation, stating that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So I think all of this lays out the gospel in a really beautiful way that if this is something you desire, you can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. If you have any questions about salvation and are wanting to learn more, um, you can email Aaron and I. We'll have our emails down in the description box. So if you're wanting to talk a little bit more about salvation and see how you can become a heavenly resident, then feel free to send us an email and we can talk with you a little bit more about it. Yeah, so going back to talking a little bit about the, the city of God versus the city of man, the people of God in the midst of the city of man, so us, like us in this world, are called not to separate, but to be distinctly different from its other inhabitants. So rather than separating ourselves from the city of man, we're called to be different, to show them a better way, to show them what it's like to be citizens of a different and better city. So Liz, what do you like, what do you think your way is practically to to show people, not necessarily preaching the gospel to them, but what are ways to show people that we are citizens of a different and better city? I think one way is joy. Um, I think a lot of people can showcase happiness, but happiness is kind of contingent on your circumstances, whereas joy is not based on your circumstances. And I think people notice when you're able to have joy in any situation in hard situations and i've had people like ask questions about oh, how are you so joyful through this and it's like because i have the joy of my salvation and joy in the lord and joy in where i'm going i know where i'm going and i can't have joy in that even if everything around me is crumbling and i think another practical way as well is complaining just this is a practical way in the workplace i think that's something that can set us apart it's so easy to complain about our circumstances, whether it's just things at work or just things going on in our personal life. But I, I think when you're able to see the world through an eternal lens, things are a lot less important in the grand scheme of things. And I also think your language too, that is something mm -hmm. that can set us apart. Um, not letting any unwholesome talk come out of our mouth, which also includes like gossip. That is something yeah. I fall into easily at work um, and with my friends. So just like being on guard against that and stepping out of situations that where that might come up, I think is another important way to be set apart. Definitely. I think simply serving others and putting, putting others above yourself is a practical way we live. I mean, like I was just talking about self-loving and self-confident. We live in a society that just is all about me, me, me. And so if we put others, even simple things, holding the door open for people, um, bringing someone a coffee, like simple things um, to serve others can go a long way. And in John 13, 35, it says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So it literally says right there, they'll know you because you have love. And if you serve other people. Uh, and then also I wanted to point out that the thing about the way that we can show people what it's like to be a citizen of a different and better city, these things, they don't change based on where we are. And I have recently had a few convictions about this. I am a new mom and there's a lot of great moms at the church that I'm currently in here in Virginia, but I'm expecting to move in a couple months. Uh, I we're supposed to get orders any day now. And so I'm expecting to not be in this church for many more months. And so in my head, I was like, like, eh, like, like, I don't really want to put in the work to get to know a bunch of people and to like even sign up serving at my church. Like it's been two years now and I haven't signed up to work in my church, but now that I'm two months out from leaving, I'm like, eh, like, no, like it's too late. I'll do it later. I'll do it at my next assignment. But truthfully, like these should be practices that we have in place, regardless of where we are, if we move, 
and all that. And so I, I, I've been convicted to like, no, like go and seek out community. You never know how with one or two meetups for coffee, you can impact someone's life. Even if you are moving a couple, couple weeks later. Yeah. So all these things, I mean, serving others, seeking community, not gossiping, not swearing. Uh, these are all ways that we quote unquote, prove our citizenship of heaven. Um, and if you spend time in the word, especially in Paul's letters, like Philippians, uh, he clearly outlines the way that we can do that. So Aaron, what are some ways that you've been able to prove your heavenly citizenship? I would say, I think there's a distinct moment in my life when I remember like finally deciding to choose or finally realizing that it's a choice, uh, like choosing Jesus, choosing Jesus is a choice, not just like the one time that you are saved, but also in the things that you watch, listen to, uh, the way you spend your time. And so I remember I was at a birthday party for someone when we were back at the Academy. So I was probably like, yeah, 20, 20 at this point. Uh, and we were just at a girl's sleepover and there wasn't necessarily anything explicitly wrong with the shows or movies that they had on, but I remember just feeling like, I just felt icky for lack of better words. Like I just felt like it wasn't worth my time. And so like, as I have gotten closer to the Lord, things that used to be no big deal have started to become a little bit of a bigger deal. And more in the sense that I've realized that I want to prove my citizenship by the way that I spend my time. Like I want to be seen as someone who is, you know, reading the Bible for one, uh, talking with others, even simple things that are healthy that we know are like healthier for us, like working out, being outside. Like I want to choose my time doing things that are going to be fruitful for the kingdom versus, versus not. And so I guess over time, like proving my citizenship, just choosing to spend my time doing things that, uh, are, are going to have a kingdom impact. No, I agree. And I feel like a similar thing kind of happened to me, but it was definitely a really gradual process. Mm Mm-hmm. I remember like asking for salvation when I was like seven years old, but I don't really remember a heart change coming out of that. It wasn't Mm -hmm. until the end of high school that I really started living my life for Christ. Um, But then again, it wasn't like one defining moment. It was kind of a gradual process of me finding Jesus in the community around me. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it wasn't like my old habits were just gone. Like it wasn't just one day I woke up and was like, I'm not going to do all these things that aren't glorifying to Christ. Um, I just gradually began obeying him and removing things from my life that didn't honor him as I learned like what it meant to be a Christian. Because when I first kind of realized that I wanted to follow Jesus in high school, I didn't really know what was completely right and what was completely wrong. It was kind of a gradual process of pruning and growing into a godly woman. And it definitely took time and it doesn't happen overnight. And I also think it's important to note that our faith is not works-based. We talked about the Romans road and that is how you receive salvation. It's not through your works, Um, but your works are a way to show the fruit of your salvation. And so when we're talking about how we're going, Proving our heavenly residency. It's not necessarily gaining salvation through our works. It's showcasing the fruit of our salvation through our actions. Definitely. And that's a really good time to bring up Ephesians. Uh, I would recommend just reading Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, the whole thing. But in verse 4, it starts, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So, and then it says again, for by grace you have been saved through faith. So that's just a good reminder. And the verse, if you haven't read it, go back and read. Go back and just just read the whole Bible, but read Ephesians, read Mm. 1 through 10. So. Uh, One other thing I thought was cool that is talked about in this study is that So the United States is often described as a melting pot, you know, a mix of cultures, people groups. Um, They've all come here and kind of assimilated in the borders that we now call America. Uh, And the military is a similar way. We have, if you include wives, like so many different uh, ethnicities, people from different countries, all uh, within the military. And while their cultures and heritages are respected, there's still a lot of assimilation 
that must occur in order to work towards the common goal of defending the United States. Although this doesn't directly work the same way, the Bible shows us a process by which citizens of the city of man assimilate into the city of God. So all these things that we're talking about, like we can still be on this earth, residents of this earth, but citizens of heaven. That wraps up our Technically third episode, but we're going over the second week of the Philippians Bible study, the new study by Planting Roots. If you want to get your hands on this study, then check out the link uh, that's down in the description. Also a reminder, Planting Roots has a ton of other Bible studies as well. Um, I point out the Bible boot camp, but there are so many more, uh, more than I can like hold to show you right now. So check them out at the link below. Uh, also follow us on Instagram, check out the website, all the things, follow and subscribe to this podcast, and we'll see you next week. As always, I'm Erin. And I'm Liz. And we pray you stay deeply rooted. Mm-hmm.